podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ann Fankner. Um, welcome to the Capital East Annex Project. I just want to wait a few more minutes and let folks jump on the line here. Um, we have over 100 people that have expressed interest in this webinar today. And um, oh, just over half the folks have uh, stepped in the door. So let's um, give everyone a few more minutes to sit down and get settled, and then we'll, we'll begin momentarily. Okie dokie. Uh, well, again, my name is Ann Fankner. Uh, welcome everyone to today's presentation discussing the uh, California Capital East Annex Project and its impact on the park and, and the trees. Uh, this presentation is part of the Sacramento chapter of the California Urban Forest Council Learn at Lunch series. Prior to COVID, uh, we offered uh, one and a half hour presentations about the urban forest and its benefits uh, specific to the Sacramento region. Uh, the sessions were held every other month at the Sacramento Tree Foundation. Um, so this is our first presentation online. Um, we'll be sending out a survey later in September to seek your input on how it went and uh, a survey of your interests for you know, future speakers and um, topics that you're interested in. So today's presentation is being recorded and will be shared. And our hope is that the information presented today will inspire you to take action, including engaging others to take action. So to be perfectly transparent here, we are looking to create a movement. Uh, there are handouts available for you to download, review, and share. Um, a bit of housekeeping here. Uh, I just want to let you know that everyone's mic is currently muted. Uh, however, questions and comments are encouraged. Uh, so please write your comments in the chat section, and I will read them at the end of the presentation. So at this time, I would like to introduce Paula Pepper. Uh, Paula is a retired research ecologist for the U.S. Forest Service. In this role, she and her fellow researchers established the science of quantifying the benefits and values of urban trees. Their work is the foundation for urban forest resource analysis around the world. Paula is an award-winning author cultural historian and ecologist. She has served on the Historic State Capital Commission, and she is considered one of the top historians on Sacramento trees. Welcome, Paula Pepper. Thank you very much, Anne, and I really appreciate uh, the council sponsoring this. It's a, it's a great opportunity for us. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you. So I'm ready to present when you are. Uh, I think um, I think you have control of the, the rain, so to speak. Okay, you're getting rid of the webcams? I will do that. There we go. Okay. All right. Well, as Ann mentioned, I, I uh, was an urban uh, ecologist for the U.S. Forest Services Center for Urban Forest Research before I retired in 2014. And my work involved measuring and assessing trees in cities across the United States to develop the tree growth equations required to run the iTree suite of tools. We calculate the energy savings, the carbon storage and sequestration, the air quality improvement and stormwater runoff reduction associated with those trees, as well as the replacement costs and aesthetic value of the trees. I'll get into those details shortly, but here's an image, your first image, taken from the recirculated draft environmental impact report on the construction planned for the capital and grounds. It is to be completed by 2014 or 2025, sorry. Because of minimal media coverage and the lack of transparency from our legislature, the majority of you have probably never seen this document, nor the first draft uh, environmental impact report. 
And there were legislated reasons for that, which I will get into in this presentation. I wanted to show this first to give you context for the talk. This is not the entire park, uh, only the blocks surrounding the Capitol from 12th Street here on out to 15th is also park. But these are the four blocks involved. This is the new annex, which uh, the old one will be demolished and this new one built with a super basement. Uh, supposedly that, it, that will allow for the alignment of the floors between the East Annex and the restored capital. Of more concern are the new underground facilities. This is a parking lot for up to 200 cars underground. And this is a new underground visitor center that's almost an acre in size. Both potentially impact many trees and both are to be deeply excavated to 30 feet. And uh, our local Nisinan and Miwok communities know that these will end up disturbing the remains of ancestors. That's the context, so on with the program. This is an aerial view from the 2014 tree inventory that was conducted that shows the approximate boundaries of the construction areas. Every dot and number you see is a tree. I've very roughly outlined the areas uh, of construction on this image. The one section that is not correct is this corner is not involved in the parking lot and a, a little bit of this section is not. So uh, there are over a hundred trees within the footprint of the current plan. There's the old Magnolia, uh, the Deodars out along 10th Street and the Redwoods facing the south side of the Capitol. Many of you who have visited the Capitol know the Deodars that line the front of the restored Capitol. Originally, there were 10. Um, there are still nine older ones existing, plus a new younger one or newer. Uh, these trees front what is fondly known as the People's Front Porch, and they provide beauty and shade and ecosystem services for our state's people during marches, protests, public events, and just general social gatherings. The area you are seeing here will be partially replaced with a skylight for the planned underground visitor center. It will be fenced off to prohibit people from walking on the skylight, thereby reducing what is known as the people's front yard. It's a pretty majestic line of trees if you've not seen it. Uh, and it's left from the beginnings of the state capitol and two of four of which will be endangered by the development of the visitor center. Arborists have discussed having uh, Environmental Design Incorporated, which is the premier big moving company nationally, to lift, hold, and then put these trees back after construction. Other certified arborists I've spoken with uh, deeply question that plan because the streets are so huge, they're top heavy, with roots intertwined with additional surrounding trees. And they question whether they can be replanted safely, given that they'll be surrounded by three concrete walls of the underground visitor center, which leaves no room for new root growth. Uh, they asked me how they would be supported structurally while they're trying to grow new roots, and I, I don't know. So other trees, uh, affected are this bunya bunya that was planted in 1882. It's over 140 feet tall and uh, within the footprint of the parking garage. These tulips represent uh, later plantings in the park, both within the footprint of the underground parking structure, as shown on the uh, early map that I showed you. And one of our oldest incense cedars was planted in the 1880s. It was pruned incorrectly decades ago, but still thrives. And it's listed as an international monumental tree. It measures 22 feet around at the trunk. It's 118 feet tall. 
and it's in the footprint of the parking structure. This coast redwood grew from a seed that was carried to the moon on Apollo 14 in 1971. It's one of 10 surviving redwood moon trees in the United States. It's scheduled to be removed with the annex construction. The hope apparently is to take some cuttings so that a second generation moon tree can be grown to replace this. Uh, but that'll take another 50 years to get to the size of this tree. The omnibus uh, memorial tree is also in that same section and looks very similar, except it's even larger than the moon tree. These four coast redwoods are on the south side of the East Annex, and they're part of a series of six planted, two of which are memorial trees. They're in the footprint of the parking structure. This Coxburg coral tree is the largest in California and also listed as an international monumental tree measuring four feet, 14 feet around the trunk. It's also in the parking structure footprint. There's a huge old Southern Magnolia to be affected by the annex construction. This is a Guadalupe Island, Island Cypress uh, affected by the parking structure. Uh, many of the older trees do not have a known history of being successfully lifted and transplanted elsewhere. Conifers like this one are unusual and they've rarely been lifted and replanted. Will all the trees be removed? How many will be removed? We, the public, do not know. Assembly member Ken Cooley is the chair of the Joint Rules Committee and we've been re told repeatedly by numerous legislators and staff members that this project is really his baby. Everything goes through him. But the most, uh, the environmental reports have told us is that from 20 to 30 trees will be permanently removed. Again, which trees? Another report said that 65 trees would be removed. Which trees? And which will be, you know, just moved and replanted and where? Huge old trees, even if they can be moved successfully, cannot be placed on top of an underground facility because of the weight restrictions. So let me give you a little bit of the history about our capital and the park. I'll actually start prior to European history in the United States. Our capital grounds were originally home to the Nisinan Indians, some descendants of whom through incredible perseverance are still with us today. The Indian populations west in San Francisco and south had already been decimated by the mission system established by the Spanish. But in 1832, John Works led his Hudson Bay Company fur traders through the Sacramento Valley. His men carried malaria and other diseases. And within a year, entire Indian towns that were suddenly inhabited or were suddenly uninhabited. By 1833, 75%, 20,000 Indians had died. Where our capital today is had first been a large Nisinan village. The act for the government and protection of Indians was then passed by our very first state legislature in 1850. And it actually legalized enslaving and also killing the Indians, anything but protection. Sunday hunts were organized here in Sacramento to bring back any part of an Indian for a $5 reward. It was also funded by the legislature. Federal legislation continued to decimate the Indian population long after that date. But the amazing perseverance of the tribes remaining here today is incredible. And their issues with the capital construction should be heard, met, and honored at our state capital. They expect the remains of ancestors will be found. The Capitol itself was built between 1861 and 1874. 
It was outgrown by the 1920s. So the State Library and Courts buildings, uh, which are west of 10th Street, were constructed. And 70 years after the Capitol was completed, it was again too small. So the famed architect, Alfred Eichler, was called in to design the East Annex, which was completed in 18, or 1952. From 1975 to 1981, the original capital was restored. So today we refer to it, or I'll refer to it as the restored capital. 70 years after the annex was completed, it seems it's again too small for legislators, legislators and their burgeoning staff. And years of benign neglect have led the legislature to want to tear it all down and build a newer, better building. <clears throat> this is something that many of us question because the capital eventually will again become too small. And then will even more of the Arboretum, a centerpiece to our city and state, be reduced? One possibly good thing I think that we've learned with COVID-19 is that state workers can work effectively from home. And there are eight other states where the legislature is not housed in their historic state capitals. One of the most important aspects of our capital is the landscape, the beautiful big trees. This park was planned from the beginning to be a showplace featuring trees from around the world. And these trees have also suffered and apparently will suffer from alternating waves of care versus neglect. They have suffered neglect from our legislature for years, given there is still no park management plan and no tree management plan. So let's just take a quick look at some of the history behind the Arboretum itself. This was very well planned from the outset to be a world-class Arboretum one of a kind, thanks to the remarkable Mediterranean climate we have here in California. The first trees were planted in 1862, but by 19 or 1878, papers were publishing this article that showed the plan uh, for the entire park and actually listed every single species that had been or would be planted. And here you can, you can see the original terraces that were around the park. And in the extended part of the park was the state agricultural building and a horse race track. You can see a few vestiges of that still today. Uh, but back then, the state fair was held here annually. By 1913, papers across the nation lauded the park this article is from the San Francisco Call, later the Chronicle Examiner, stating that there is a tree from every nation on earth. But similar articles appeared in Eastern newspapers about our park, including the New York Times. And really, um, the Arboretum is, is still thriving. Uh, it has 210 species of trees in one 40-acre location but nearly half of those species are represented by only one tree. We've needed a tree management plan to figure out removal and replacement as the trees age and eventually have to be replaced. There has never been such a plan, not since 1878, although most major arboretums have them. So I'm hoping this will work uh, online. But I accepted the appointment to the Historic State Capital Commission in 2014 because my understanding was that part of our job was to create a master plan for the park grounds. And I knew a good tree management plan was needed to add to that plan. So many of the trees were suffering from drought mandated water reductions. If you remember, um, Governor Brown really wanted the park to be an example of water conservation, but cutting off water instantly had a horrible impact, and particularly on the conifers. Since the uh, Legislative Joint Rules Committee wouldn't allow us to create the master plan, 
I went to work with ground supervisor Mike Nielsen to create a list of trees we would need within the next 10 years. I'd find the seed source, Mike's budget would pay for seed and sealing, seedlings a little each year as his budget could afford, and the UC <clears throat> Arboretum Teaching Nursery joined us and agreed to propagate and properly grow the trees. So this is a little video, and let's see if it will play. continue to age, it's important to make sure that we do everything we can to ensure that this arboretum continues for future generations to be able to enjoy. With the drought, uh, we lost almost 10% of the forest here, the trees in Capitol Park. And that was a, a huge concern because this has been an arboretum, uh, a botanic garden established in originally in 1875, and then uh, the park itself started being planted out in 1878. There are 210 unique species of trees in this park. 97 of those only have one specimen, which is true of most arboretums. But we began losing so many, especially the conifers. We're now in partnership with the UC Davis Arboretum and Teaching Nursery. They are just doing a fantastic job. So we're starting a lot of the plants for the capital by seed because they're really, a lot of them are unusual. They're not commonly found in the trade. And so we have to send them from seed because they're not easily accessible. That's why we've got so many that are little tiny stages. It'll take years for them to get to the point where we can plant them out. But it's really exciting for us to be able to get to work with this project because they're unusual plants. It's a unique opportunity. For the capital project, we're using special tree pots. So some of them are really deep, some of them are air pruning pots. Both are with the goal of creating a really strong root system that it helps establish the trees really well once you plant them into the capital park. We're growing a, a lot of different species. There's not just one plant that we're growing for the capital. Um, we're going to be growing many different types of species, and all of them have different rates of growth and different habits and different needs. So trying to uh, figure out all of these specific things about the plant. Some of these only grow a couple of inches a year. So these plants with these, these pots with the channels in them are designed to encourage that downward root growth. And by shifting these up into in bigger sizes each time, we're going to make sure that these roots don't constrict. This box elder is part of the Civil War Memorial Grove, and all the trees from this grove came originally from battlefields, the Civil War. A couple of years ago, a tree came down, fell, dropped this tree, and now UC Davis is going to help us take cuttings and clone from the original tree a new tree. With cuttings, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, the side branches and the main branches of this tree, and I'm going to try to induce the roots to come out of the bottom of this versus growing leaves. I'm going to try to make it grow roots. The UC Davis Arboretum and Teaching Nursery will hold them for us until they're ready to plant. We're very grateful to the UC Davis Arboretum in their partnership and helping us with this tree replacement program here at Capitol Park. So you can uh, see some of the species right there that we are growing, and uh, we've made some progress, but the project is really limited by the lack of funding to G DGS Capital Park grounds for much of any new tree seed seedling purchases. Mike Nielsen and Valetta Campbell with DGS do the best they can with the budget they're given, but uh, neither the Joint Rules Committee nor the legislature have taken a deep interest in perpetuating the park as the arboretum it was created to be. So another effort that I made in working on the Historic State Capital Commission was to create a presentation on the ecosystem services and the challenges facing the park's trees today in hopes of creating a tree management plan. The commission voted to support the plan, but Chairman Cooley of Joint Rules said we'd have to wait until 
all construction was completed in 2025. Today's presentation is solely on the ecosystem services provided by the trees that may be affected by that construction. Again, uh, the presentation is based entirely on the only public information available, the draft environmental and recirculated draft environmental reports. This is the tree inventory map, a rough of it, and these are the four zones of the inventory that will be affected uh, within the construction area. So what ecosystem services do these trees provide? And what are the ecosystem services that I measured? First, trees save energy in various ways, from direct shading of buildings to cooling the air through transpiration, thereby reducing temperatures, shading paved surfaces, reducing wind speed. We use air conditioning less due to these cooling effects, which reduce the ambient air temperature. And as a result, less power is drawn and energy savings reduces power plant emissions, thereby improving air quality. Energy uh, use includes here both gas and electricity. And the greatest loss uh, in benefits, as this shows, will be associated with two southeast and two southwest of the park, where the underground parking lot is planned and also the southern half of the visitor's center. So um, the trees save 18.4 megawatt hours of electricity every year, enough to power for 24 hours, 252 homes. They reduce natural gas consumption by a very small amount of 99 therms. Trees absorb gaseous pollutants through their leaves and uh, they filter small particles out of the air, which has been pretty helpful with the fires lately. And they convert the pollutants to produce oxygen and volatile organic compounds. They also shade sort of paved surfaces, as well as parked cars along the streets surrounding the park, and thereby reduce uh, evaporative hydrocarbon emissions and the formation of ozone. These trees, uh, among those, the, the items that we studied, they include uh, oxygen, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and the avoided particulate matter. Plants also produce, as I mentioned before, biogenic volatile compound emissions, which contribute to global warming. These trees improve air quality by removing 198 pounds of air pollutants every year. Carbon storage is pretty interesting. Um, trees capture and store carbon dioxide in their wood and leaves as they grow. In fact, if you removed all the leaves from this tree, then dry out all that tree's wood, half of the remaining weight is stored carbon. Of course, when trees die, they decompose and release carbon dioxide, unless you do as Assemblymember Cooley did and arrange for the wood to be salvaged from recently war fallen Civil War memorial trees and turned into usable items like furniture then it remains stored. Tree care activities also release carbon dioxide. The trees in this study, as you can see on the left, have stored nearly 610,000 pounds of carbon in their wood. If these trees are lost, so is the carbon they've stored. And they capture every year 33,800 pounds of atmospheric carbon dioxide reducing the amount of CO2 that goes into the atmosphere. It has a clear impact on global warming in our community. And large trees that are lost or removed and replaced, um, or replaced, we think they'll be replaced with younger trees of species not known to the public yet, but they will take decades to come close to replacing what has been lost through construction. Trees also reduce runoff volume, the peak flow and flow duration that go into our gutters and, and uh, into the 
rivers eventually, but they slow down the flow and promote infiltration and evapotranspiration. Also improving the groundwater recharge and reducing the incidence of combined sewer overflow. By doing these things, they provide water quality improvements and reduced treatment costs at the plants. The trees in this study intercept over 168,000 gallons of rainfall every year, thereby avoiding runoff while recharging groundwater levels. That's equal to about 2,000 bathtubfuls of water every year. Now, with aesthetics, um, there was really no legitimate way for me to study this because we use uh, property values of homes. And of course, this isn't a home. Uh, and there was no way to, to date for us to assess the historic value of the trees, the shade value, the health benefits, or the overall benefits uh, with the heat island to the surrounding island area. So in summary, the trees in the construction footprint save 18.4 megawatt hours of electricity, 99 therms of natural gas, over almost 34,000 pounds of carbon dioxide, almost 200 pounds of air pollutants, and permanently store 610,000 pounds of carbon in their wood. On average, they supply about $200 per tree in benefits every year. Um, that's probably close to $22,000 in the ecosystem services that I've described. But something important to note is that the tree growth equations that I created do not grow trees to the size of the trees that are in this park. So these benefits are greatly underestimated. There are 30 large and some unique trees, historical trees that provide the most benefits. Among these are you know, the 11 redwoods, Banya Banya, Diodars, Instant Cedars, um, and the rest that you, you see here. The greatest loss of benefits due to the construction are in to south and southwest and southeast, as I mentioned before, which cover the underground parking structure and the southern half of the new underground visitor center. The greatest potential impact to historical trees include those currently existing on the site of the underground parking lot and the visitor center. But also several large redwoods, including the moon and uh, omnibus memorial redwood trees, which will be removed with the east annex. We, the public using the park, need to know the landscape plans for each phase of park construction. Should this project go on as is reported in the DEIRs? Which trees will be permanently removed? Which lifted and held to be transplanted later and where? What new species of trees are gonna go in? What is the estimated survival rate of those transplanted trees? The draft environmental reports on this project do not say, and the public deserves to know. California, after all, consider, considers itself a, a climate change leader. So it seems pretty ironic that legislative leaders are promoting a huge underground parking structure and the damage to and removal of trees. So lastly, regarding benefits, take a look at an aerial of canopy cover taken a few years ago by the Bureau of Land, Land Management. They did the entire canopy cover in our city, but this is an enlargement of the Capitol Park section. You see the entire park here, and you see already that there are many fewer trees surrounding the Capitol than in the other areas. So, you know, if they put the parking lot to the south, they can't place large trees, as I said, on top of the facility. The, the weight is too much. The visitor center actually has more trees than are shown on this. The magnolias in the, in the first terrace aren't, don't show up on this. Uh, the bunya bunya, the tulips, all of these um, 
and the removal of all these will increase uh, air temperatures outside. So um, Mr. Cooley's staff have put up a website and please copy down this address and really take a look at it. It's available to you all. Um, most people don't even know about it, but the address is on top and uh, you can access info under the first capital link on how bad the current access is safety wise. And that's true. After many years of what California State Preservation Society's term benign neglect, the State Office of Historic Preservation has still not received any documents to review on the new planned construction. And that's required under state law. If you scroll down on that landing page, you can see a more recent addition uh, that's on the visitor center. After months of not much activity on this site, it's interesting that now there are changes as we've pushed for more information. But the new visitor center section has no mention of its size, nor that it will block a large section of the people's front yard where we gather to protest and celebrate and hang out blocked because, you know, of the skylight that I mentioned. And uh, in the DEIRs, there are no artist renderings, nor on this website are there artist renderings of any of the structures that will be built. If you click, click on the uh, link I've outlined in red here, you can also access information on the brand new state office building. All the legislature will move into for the years that construction is happening at the Capitol. It's at uh, 10th and O Street, right behind the legislative office building. And it's progressing rapidly as the legislature passed laws that said they didn't have to go through a bidding process that the rest of us and the state has to in order to build. Um, also, this structure, construction on it was not canceled nor is the plan for the state capitol, as uh, all the other executive branch buildings has, have been canceled due to the COVID bu budget crisis. Um, when you're on this page, you can click on this and you'll watch a video of the site with Mr. Cooley that shows it will have access to everyone, including ADA access. Meanwhile, we're still spending $1.3 billion on the swing building and the capital annex project combined. Apparently without the legislature considering any of the other options that they could, the restoration, rehabilitation, renovation, or reconstruction of the annex, which is on the historic National Historic Register. Um, so you can click on the Capitol Park icon and see that Mr. Cooley is bent on saving some trees that have fallen down. Apparently not so much on the trees that are still standing. By 1902, there were 37 trees planted from Civil War battle sites in the Memorial Grove. Now there are only eight left since three went down in the winter storms of 2017. There are numerous other older trees being nursed along and for a number of them, the contracted certified arborist has recommend they have deeper studies conducted on their roots uh, to look at the disease possibilities. But those studies cost around three to $5,000 per tree and the park budget is, is currently too small to afford those costs. It's important to note um, also, that the Civil War Memorial site is not even in the construction zone. It is east of the construction zones. So where is a discussion on this website of what is going to happen to trees in the construction zone? We can't find out. Um, we, you know, contractors are under non-disclosure agreements. They can't talk to the public. They could not talk to the historical state capital commission. You also on that website can see a recent uh, frequently asked question update page, and it's listed under the resources and publications tab. This one really caught my eye. Um, 
the concerns about the number of trees impacted appear to be based upon the unfortunate assumption that the entire area as shown in the EIR will be the actual footprint used for the project, which is not correct. Look, <laughs> the public only has the draft EIRs at our disposal. And if they don't describe what and where construction is going to happen, why not? What is correct? Where will buildings go? Isn't that what EIRs are all about? Where will the parking lot end up? Any place else in the park impacts even more trees. It's really time to provide the public with the entire picture before a single shovel hits the ground and give us the costs and who and how we are going to pay for them now with COVID and fires wreaking havoc with our state budget, not to mention our personal budgets. So how is this happening? How did this come about? It started well before 2016, the year the first legislation for the project was passed. It had to be planned, but the first any of the public could have any knowledge of it would come really pretty much via the media, but even the media did not or does not know or report the extent of the project. There's been minimal coverage statewide, let alone in the Sacramento region. Four main pieces of legislation were passed for the project. Senate bills 836 and 840, and Assembly bills 1826 and 2667. You can access parts of those bills on Mr. Cooley's website. So what did they allow? These bills authorized and funded the project. They authorized the construction of a no-bid swing building. They authorized the annex, parking structure, and visitor center. But what is interesting to me is AB or Senate Bill 836 states that they may pursue the construction of a state capitol building annex or the restoration, rehabilitation, renovation, or reconstruction of the state capitol building annex. So, <laughs> More things that they allowed is they changed the regulations for the final EIRs and the draft EIRs. They reduced the time that the public has for input on these. They also provided California Environmental Quality Act relief, which has ended up greatly reducing the ability of any of us to contest this project in court. It exempted the legislator, legislature from contracting regulations that the rest of the state has to go through. They don't have to get bids. And it insulated the project from future budget uncertainty. So if, if the budget, if some budget crunch happened, which now it has, unfortunately, the funds were, would be returned to general funds, but then automatically, projects would be funded by revenue bonds. That adds uh, another 30% in interest over time to the cost of the project. A little bit more about the Historic State Capital Commission. Um, it's made up of two Senate and uh, two Assembly and three ex officio members. The ex officio members are the state archivist, the state librarian, and the state historic preservation officer, the latter of which, as I mentioned, has not received documents on the project to review as is required by law. Our job was to protect historical and architectural restoration in perpetuity. In 2012, we were also statutorily obligated to take care of the park and create a park management plan. But as this project went on, many of us have resigned. One actually resigned uh, almost two years ago, hasn't been filled by the legislature. Uh, another member left, she had to move uh, to another state in 2020, April 2020, and that hasn't been filled. But in March 16th and March 17th, I resigned followed by the chair and at this point, there's barely enough people to fulfill 
or statutory obligations given lack of a quorum. But, you know, Mr. Cooley advised us um, that we would need, as I said, to wait until after new construction, five years, to do the park management plan. We requested lots of documents and they were denied by the Joint Rules Committee, of which he is the chair. Anybody who came to speak to us either said they didn't know anything or they were under non-disclosure agreements. And our meetings um, with Mr. Cooley produced no more solid information. So in frustration, Dick and I decided we actually might be able to do more if we resigned from the commission and could actually start letting the public know about the secrecy surrounding this project. So we have, with a large coalition now, created public accountability for our capital. The email address is there. It's essentially pacannexproject at gmail.com. And you can reach us at that. We've recently submitted uh, more Freedom of Information requests for documents regarding the analysis of preservation versus demolition, if it was done, and uh, also the massive rebuilding, and these are required. We've requested public documents on which the vote to demolish the annex was based versus renovating it and rehabbing it, and also documents uh, on a spatial needs analysis. We really want us the public paying for this project to be able to view everything and voice our opinions. We have spent months speaking to legislative members and staff and working to alert the public. Please contact this email address if you would like more information. Some of our coalition members include the Environmental Council of Sacramento, ECOS, the Sacramento Tree Foundation, Save Our Heritage Organization, California Historical Society, East Sacramento Preservation, Sacramento Valley Urban Forest Council, who's bringing this to you today, the California Preservation Foundation, California Garden and Landscape History Society, Sierra Club of Sacramento, Trees for Sacramento, and we have over 3,000 or close to 3,000 petition signers at this point to pause the project. Today, we're facing so many more issues than we did a year ago. We really think it should be paused and then rethought with plenty of public input because it's our capital, not the legislature's, not the governor's, but ours. And it's our money that will pay for construction. The annex is unsafe after years of benign neglect. The swing building will be finished in 2021. So move to it and then analyze your real needs given today's remote learning and working. Preserve, rehabilitate, and renovate the East Annex. The DEIRs state that damage will be done to the old restored capital while constructing the new annex, but it can be repaired. Well, why can't the annex be repaired? Mr. Cooley says that moving to the swing building doesn't work because only the annex project allows us to maintain the, quote, character of our government, end quote. I'm not even sure what character of government means, except to exemplify a demolish, destroy, and rebuild a new mentality. There is already a tunnel between the legislative office building and the Capitol. Why not build at a much lower cost a tunnel from the swing building that connects to that and takes them into the capital. We also really want the legislature to follow the statutory guidelines that require a full analysis of all options regarding the project. Create the park management plan now that includes a complete tree management plan with sub plans for replacing lost trees incorporating International Society of Arboriculture certified pruning and maintenance practices, sources for new trees, and American Standards, Institute of Standards guidelines 
for protecting trees during construction. But mostly, let's have full public disclosure now on exactly what and where construction is to happen and give the public adequate notice for input. This is our capital, as I said, not the legislators. So these are what's at risk. The historic East Annex will be destroyed and replaced. This affects four very significant blocks of the park and trees will be greatly affected. Exactly how many and which ones, we don't know. We're facing a lot of rough years ahead. We're already $54 billion in the hole in this state and we have huge issues. Not just the fires and COVID, but social justice, equity, climate change, homelessness, which is going to increase with COVID. So 1.3 billion plus interest is not a pittance to most of us. The capital itself is 755 million for the parking lot, visitor center, and annex restoration. If you add as a legislative office or uh, analyst office states, uh, there's an average 30% interest on revenue bonds. So that brings our cost now just for this construction to nearly a billion dollars over time. So pause the project and let's rethink it and have public input. If you're upset by the plan, speak up. Seriously, it's very important that all of our voices be heard. Here are the key people you should write to and uh, their email addresses. Anne will also post, or she already has uh, posted a complete contact sheet that has snail mail and email addresses and phone numbers for these people. So we suggest that you both call and mail them. People who answer the phones tend to keep records of who calls and why and on what subject and if you oppose or are for it. So she'll post various other handouts on the project too, which will give you additional information. That's all I have and I'd like to thank you very much for your time and your interest in this. Paula, thank you. Um, I've just activated my camera. If you could do the same, please. As you can imagine, um, there's quite a few uh, questions and comments. Um, I'd like to begin uh, with a comment by Dick Allen, your uh, the, the former chair, and then um, I'd like to answer one or two of the easy questions, and then I'll uh, share the others that were uh, specific ones with you. Um, okay. We did. Uh, we did um, schedule this uh, webinar for a full 90 minutes. Um, so uh, to repeat what Paula said, this is being recorded. It will be posted on the California Urban Forest Council website, the specific um, Sacramento Valley chapter website. Uh, it will also be on our Facebook page. Uh, as well as this um, presentation, we have been featuring specific trees that Paula mentioned in the presentation in a little more detail on our Facebook page. So that has been leading up. There's about 15 of them uh, with more details. Um, Dick Cowan uh, says the visitor center would also have a very large hole in the ground, a below grade gathering place for visitor groups to assemble, but not accessible at grade level for gathering. Thanks, Dick. Um, uh, let's see, somebody, a couple of people came on late and asked if it's being recorded. Yes, I think I, I just addressed that about the um, what distinguishes a monumental tree. And the answer is it's specific to the species. It could be um, the tallest, the biggest, the oldest, and um, it depends on that specific tree. I invite you to uh, go to memorialtrees.com and that specifies um, thousands of uh, international uh, monumental trees. Okay, Paula, are you ready? I'll do the best I can and what I can't answer, uh, we will ask you to send a 
a question to the PAC Annex project. At Sounds good. Um, I want to start with one kind of backtracking to the earlier part of the, uh, the presentation. You're talking about the trees specifically and this concept of moving trees. Are you aware of um, any examples where 50 foot plus foot trees have been moved successfully? Yes. Yes, um, and in fact, the company that I mentioned, uh, Environmental Design Incorporated, has very successfully moved some large redwoods and a large oak. Um, I'm not sure there are trees that are 100 feet tall and better, though, um, as these are. Um, Michael Neumann is the urban forester for the city of Roseville, and he writes, um, I think you've addressed the piece of this, but I'm just going to read the question in its entirety. Are there any consulting arborist firms involved in this project that support the state and have any reports, designs, or alternatives been shared from these firms with the public? Have the reports been requested? Are they part of the EIR? The reports are not part of the EIR. Uh, we have asked repeatedly for the landscape plan reports. Um, and there is a, an outstanding firm that has been involved in this project. Um, Ed Sturtz and Gordon Mann are part of that. And they're excellent, you know, ISA certified arborists. Um, but they're under non-disclosure agreements. Or they were for... Uh, all of us to talk to with the Historic State Capital Commission. Um, Gordon Mann uh, asks, how much money is needed for the DGS to develop the other 17 trees or more if needed? Has that been evaluated, Paula? Yes, um, we're looking at probably, well, there's two issues here. Um, for the other 17 species, it will cost um, pretty close to $3,000, which is a pittance, but Mike is also under state purchasing um, restrictions. And so he can only go to local businesses. And so we've had to work to find local businesses that would order the seed for us or order you know, seedlings or the trees for us. And some of which uh, seed that has come from the Boston Arboretum and other places I just paid for myself because mm -hmm. it was not that much. Does that answer the question enough? Um, if not, I'll ask the uh, person who asked it to reformulate the question a little bit. Okay. Um, it seems like it would make sense to have a plan for all the trees in the capital area. Is there any requirement for a tree plan for the larger area? No. The on requirement, right? No, but there is a requirement for the master plan for Capitol Park. And part of that, the Historic State Capital Commission agreed would be a tree management plan. And that was voted and passed on by park and Mr. Cooley actually agreed to that but in five years. Um, Gordon Mann actually get, uh, listed another question that's a follow-up to the question about propagation. Um, he's asking um, what if someone else funds that that effort beside the state would that would that help in any way and what might that constitute? You know I think that would be welcomed. But, uh, you know, we'd have to talk to uh, Mike Nielsen and Valletta Campbell and figure out how that can be done. Um, also, Gordon, you gave some good ideas about where this could be posted. Uh, for everyone, again, our intention here is to spread the net wide. So any resources, um, any groups that you belong to, we welcome the opportunity to, to share this information. And I apologize for speaking so quickly earlier. Uh, this presentation will be is being recorded. It will be shared with all of you who are on the line right now. It will be posted on the California Urban Forest Council website, as well as the Sacramento chapter of the California Urban Forest Council website. Paula, 
It will also, uh, let's see, next Wednesday, I'm being uh, interviewed as part of uh, Randall White's um, Insight program. And they have said that they will post the entire presentation on their Capital Radio website as well. Right, Capital Public Radio. Yep. Exactly. You have. You froze. Oh, sorry. Do you know the time of that uh, presentation next Wednesday? Uh, I'm scheduled to begin roughly at 9.06. The program starts at 9. Uh, but, of course, it'll be bumped if there's some huge big news that they have to cover. Oh, that's so 2020 of you. <laughs> yes. Every day. Every day. Um, let's see. Jennifer Garland says, can donations be accepted to do the additional analysis on the special trees and to fund a master and management plan? Plus, it seems ill-conceived to do a plan after the construction. What is the reason behind that? <laughs> you know, we don't know. I mean, we explained to Mr. Cooley and uh, some of his staff members who uh, attended our meetings that um, these plans could actually help them expedite the entire process. It would not block the process. And, and we've been trying to create this tree management plan since 2014. Um, and the uh, overall park management plan. So, yeah, there was another part to that question, was there? Uh, uh, I don't know, Jen, I think she answered the, your question, but um, I'm going I'm to actually move on here. Elizabeth Lanham is an urban forester in the, the Bay Area, and she uh, would like to offer um, a suggestion. She says, um, email is, is the least effective, mail or call so you don't get filtered out. Uh, thank you for that insight, Elizabeth. Um, she's been rather involved in um, public advocacy, so I Appreciate your, your insight. That's great. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, this is right up your, uh, this is right in your wheelhouse, Paula. <laughs> if the project moves forward and construction begins, what will happen to the artifacts and remains of the native Indians that are unearthed? You know, I can't actually answer all of that. Um, we have heard that uh, the tribes have asked for a site on the Capitol grounds that uh, where anything that is found will be reburied. The site will not be marked necessarily unless they, they choose to do it. Um, you know, it's they'll probably run into more remains when they go to excavate for the East Annex, um, going deep with that. But, you know, the village was at the front of the Capitol, under the old Capitol probably, um, and around the parking lot, you know, they're very concerned about all those areas but we're unable to get uh, information. Um, a couple of people have been asking, you know, what, what can I do? Um, you know, what, do you want to um, talk a little bit about the uh, handouts that are available and how people can use that, use the handouts? Uh, yes, let me, I've been sending uh, multiple handouts <laughs> to multiple places. So uh, let me take a look. Are we able to look at them, Anne? Yeah, they're, um, I have them um, uploaded um, here. One is um, the Senate Assembly um, okay. contacts. Okay. So um, kind of what you're saying before, um, find your uh, legislator. Um, yeah, and that, don't know. yeah, that actually uh, gives all the information, including the snail mail for both the state capital and state district office for mm -hmm. each person. Um, and then there's uh, a bulletin that we've produced called What's Wrong with the Current Plan? 
and some of what I've talked about today is in that. And there's another document, Arguments for Replanning the Capital, which has quite a number of rebuttals to uh, things that Mr. Cooley has stated about the project and about what we're trying to do. There's a call to action called What Can We Do? that will give you information on how you can address some of the things. And then there is from September 1st, a copy of the press release from public accountability for our capital. So hopefully between those five items, you'll get enough information. You should get plenty of information, whether you're concerned about the historic East Annex being destroyed, the Eichler building, or the trees. Great, thanks. And the um, link to the um, change.org, the petition, that's involved, that's embedded in, in one of the documents, I imagine? Yes, it is. Super. Yes, it is. Um, let's see, I'm going to read um, another question here. Has the California SHPO promoted the idea that as a significant cultural landscape, a cultural a cultural landscape report should be prepared to identify historically significant plant materials and outline a treatment plan that would preserve these historic resources um, significant at the statewide and potentially nationwide level. Um, thank you for that, Jan Woolley. Um, she is the uh, California State Park historian, um, retired. Thank you for your, your question, Jan. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the SHPO officer has not received um, the, the plans to comment on them beyond what she received as a member of the Historic State Capital Commission. Uh, but she hasn't received the formal documents to be able to respond. So. I'm sure part of what she would be addressing is that. That's all she's got. You know, I mean, she doesn't have yeah. the documents. Right, that really speaks to kind of the core of, um, you know, key piece of your talk, that lack of information, lack of transparency. Non-disclosure. Um, non -disclosure. <laughs> yeah, it's really been um, a problem. This pro pro uh, project is moving forward with very little information and the, um, the outcome could be significant. Well, and I have to say, really, the Department of General Services has been really good to us for working on uh, trying to supply as much information as we ask for. Um, but most recently, we've heard that it resides with the Joint Rules Committee, which Ken Cooley is the head of, as do the bids and the contracts, ultimately. So if somebody had 20 minutes to give of their time, what, what one action would you recommend would have the most impact at this point? I would use your computer, write a letter, a formal letter uh, that you can change the heading to, to Senator Tony Atkins, to Anthony Rendon, um, to Mr. Cooley, to the governor, and I would mail each of those, snail mail each of them. If you don't have that time, use the email site and call. You can probably do both those things within 20 minutes and contact all these people. Great. Um, just to clarify um, about the PAC, is that a 501c3 and is it accepting donations to help spread the word or even donations for funding of, or co-funding a management plan? I actually think we would, it, it's, but it's not a 501c3 program. Okay, so it's just, a, it's just a consortium at this point. Yes, yes. Okay. But please contact um, Dick Cowan. He's kind of running the uh, our budget end, I think, and uh, 
he is available at packannex.com at gmail or packannexproject at gmail.com. Do you have time for another few questions, Paula? Sure. Okay, great. Um, answer. <laughs> Marion asked, um, said that you mentioned that the large trees cannot be planted over the underground structures due to weight. Does the underground building affect the depth of soil above it and limit the types of vegetation that can be planted in that area? Great question. Yeah, um, and I cannot remember right now how much soil is on top of those, but the the weight of the mature trees that we've talked about is too much and it they would not go on top for a couple of reasons. There's rooting issues, uh, but mostly the weight constraints. When I worked in uh, with uh, New York City, they were just starting to do all the green roofs that are all over Manhattan and uh, realized pretty quickly that they were, they had to go with very small trees, you know, yeah. that never got bigger than 15 feet in height. Yeah, I've noticed that on a lot of um, green roofs th uh, internationally, it's mostly grasses and yeah. um, smaller, smaller perennials. Um, stop me if I've already asked this question, but I think it's, I think it's a fresh one to, to us. Um, is there evidence that these projects are related to or influenced by California OES and or Homeland Security oversight technologies and, you know, safety focuses? Are the NDAs uh, uh, the only evidence of this likelihood? Are the what's the only? Uh, Non-disclosures, the only, um, evidence of this likelihood. Yeah, I mean, we don't think that that is happening. Um, yeah. You know, Homeland Security, um, we don't think that's happening. Or OES, though, of course, you know, the, the parking structure can have a second function, which is as a giant bomb shelter. <laughs> you know? or a place to escape to. Um, but I don't know, you know, I mean, what's going to happen for the three years that they have to figure out parking for the swing building? They'll probably get pretty used to whatever system they end up using. <laughs> yeah. You know, I have a question, Paula. Um, I'm, I know that um, at the California Capitol, there are tunnels that connect many of the older buildings to the state capitol. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me like that might be an option uh, by connecting a tunnel to the swing building, that might solve a lot of these problems. Yes. Um, assumed problems. Yeah. Uh, around capacity and, and technology and such. As well as cost. Um, as I mentioned, uh, this building is behind the legislative office building. And there is already a tunnel from the legislative office building um, to the state capitol. So they could just connect to that tunnel or build a completely new one. Um, so that would be under the park or would that be under, would that impact the park grounds, the uh, tunnel? Well, there's already a tunnel. Um, okay, I'm sorry, but for connecting that, would that be within, would, would the connection be within the, would the logical connection be within the, uh, the park footprint or off underneath another building? I, I don't know. Don't know. <laughs> I think that would have to be examined by engineers <laughs> to right. figure that out. Right, right. Um, well, I think we've covered everything, and uh, boy, I sure do appreciate your um, your uh, attention to this and really uh, raising the call of concern uh, about the about the the trees, about the process. Um, about the lack of information and um, kind of almost feels like that rolling ball in uh, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And uh, there is, yeah. here we are pushing, pushing away at it. Um, I think the key here is the more people that are aware of this situation, like you said, it hasn't been out in the public. It hasn't been published. Um, so we're really leaning on everyone um, 
who's aware of this to help push it out. Push, share, talk about it with your friends, your colleagues. Um, you know, Paul and I are happy to uh, be a resource. The certainly the the PAC um, is a great place to refer people to. It's kind of the hub of all information here. Yep, be very happy to to help you on all of this and. Uh... I certainly really appreciate um, all of your time that you've taken to listen to this and your questions, really good questions. Yeah, yeah. Let me uh, scoot down to make sure I haven't missed any others. Um, I, think, I think we've covered it. Uh, I wanna thank everyone for their time and attention today. Uh, again, we will be sending out the recording uh, so that you can review uh, and share it with um, others that care about trees, care about the, um, the legislative process, uh, care about transparency in government. Um, thank you all for your time. And Paula, thank you so much uh, for leading this effort. And we look forward to hearing you on the radio next week on the 9th on Capitol Public Radio. Thank, thank you, you so everyone. much. And Take care in this COVID climate. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.